My name is Terence. And before we start this session, can I invite everybody to please turn your mobile devices to silent. So today, for the final presentation of the day, we have Associate Professor Nyam Ki Yuan from the NUS Yong Lu Lin School of Medicine to speak on this topic, leveraging artificial intelligence and informatics to improve healthcare. We will also be having a question and answer session after the talk. So for those who are tuning in online, you can type in your questions on the chat box next to the video. And for those who are in person, you can either scan the QR code, which will appear later on screen, or you can go to the mic, which is in the middle of the room. Okay, so now without further ado, let me please help me to welcome our speaker, Associate Professor Nyam. Professor, please. All right. Um, thank you very much uh, for uh, attending this afternoon. My name is uh, Dr. Nyan. I'm a uh, surgeon by training, but also the head and the program lead for the Masters of Biomedical Informatics degree at the Yong Lulin School of Medicine in Singapore. So it gives me great pleasure today to share some of the um, exciting new areas that we are working on. Uh, in, th in the space of AI in healthcare and how the Masters of Biomedical Informatics is a way in which uh, uh, students can upskill themselves um, to meet the demands and the requirements of uh, this very exciting area uh, in healthcare. So, as some of you know, uh, just even before the pandemic, we are seeing uh, a rise in the use of data as well as the use of artificial intelligence in healthcare. And it's not just limited to healthcare, but uh, indeed every sector, every industry is being uh, impacted by the way we can employ AI in, health, in, in the uh, various fields. So the exciting part about this is that healthcare is always slightly behind most industries, right? When it comes to implementing uh, uh, solutions in, in healthcare, because uh, precisely because healthcare is a very um, restricted area, restric restricted space. If you consider the kind of data that we have, our patients' data, um, that can't be easily exchanged between uh, hospitals and groups of people. And because of that, <clears throat> there's a higher barrier of entry for um, traditionally for uh, new technology going into healthcare. Um, however, in the last few years, uh, we are seeing a completely new sort of um, uh, trend or almost a new source of energy right, when it comes to um, implementing new technologies in healthcare. So, and that's largely brought about because of digitizing of records. I mean, in Singapore, we have digital, electronic digital records for almost 20 years. Uh, but the difference is that now the data is more available than it has ever been. So this changes the way <clears throat> we can use that data um, for the purposes of improving patient care. Of course, uh, like I mentioned, there are new technologies that's come that's uh, now emerged to help us better use this data. Uh, things like uh, artificial intelligence, as well as things like cloud computing, holo medicine, and robots. Right. So some pictures you can see here. These are surgeons looking at a hologram in an operating theater setting. Okay, and surgeons again looking at. Uh, screens that are actually holographic project projections. Now, these technologies are new, right? And they are finding their way into every part of healthcare in, in, you know, in almost every, every aspect of healthcare, not just in surgery, but also in education and administration. You couple that with the most, with the most current uh, kind of uh, implementation or most current kinds of technology. Uh, I'm sure all of you have heard about uh, ChatGPT and large language models. So these language models change the way healthcare is transacted. Now, one of the traditional problems that we have had uh, over many years is that you know, the healthcare data is all written in text, right? You see a doctor, they write notes, right? And um, the nurses, they write prose and text, and so on and so forth. And in Singapore, we have a slightly unique situation where the, the doctors write in a certain way, right? We are very efficient. We write in point form, we write in abbreviations. Uh, this creates um, some difficulty when it comes to using what we'll term as a, a traditional la natural language uh, processing kind of um, uh, algorithms. But with the new language models that are more easily trainable and trained on la large corpuses of data, large amounts of data, this changes that fact, right? So just a couple of weeks ago, we, I was able to simply 
um, use a, a open source language model to recognize or extract information from local text, that is, uh, text that's created by doctors in Singapore. So that tells you um, the kind of uh, potential and the power of using or applying these uh, technologies to the, um, to the uh, healthcare text that we have. And just, just one other min minutiae to, to share. Now, we've been working on AI technology for many years, right? But um, with these new technologies, suddenly um, we are able to extract more information. No matter how hard you train a traditional uh, convolutional neural network model or uh, a dual layer models or multi layer models, they, their performance does not equate to the latest uh, language models. And the best part about la the latest language models is that uh, you don't have to be a, you know, a coder for the last 10 years to be able to use it. You can, you can use it just by asking the right questions. So things like the, th the term that's being used now is called prompt engineering. So being able to ask the language models the right questions for it to extract the information from the underlying data. So these are all very exciting developments. And in healthcare, more than in any other sector, the use of language models uh, is going to be a powerful tool because we record information in free text. Now, if you look at some of the um, uh, areas that I've talked about, uh, and we, we now face a different kind of problem. The biggest problem we face now is how do we train people to use these um, tools well? It's no longer a situation of, oh, do we have the data? Or do we have the methods? We have the data. We have the methods. We even have the computing power to do this, right? At least in, in NUS and, and in NUHS, uh, where I work. Uh, we have the computing power for us to run these models. The question then comes to, do we have the talent, the people trained to do this? And this is the premise of um, the Masters in Biomedical Informatics, where we want to train people to be able to use um, this data and these tools well. So the, the model itself, uh, the, the curriculum itself is modeled after the American Medical Informatics Association um, uh, sort of curriculum matrix. Um, but we have adapted it to include some of these new technologies, right? So, for example, the AMIA does not specify the use of artificial intelligence as part of its curriculum matrix, but we built in AI into every aspect of the modules that we offer. We also offer two specializations because not everybody wants to uh, just specialize in the health data science aspects. So some, um, some students want to look into management, so we do have a hospital uh, management specialization on top of the analytics specialization. So I'll share some of the module features in a minute. Um, we also offer uh, the, uh, an opportunity for you to undertake uh, intensive uh, internships, whether with the healthcare organization or in a public or private organization of your choice. Right? The candidate can undertake a project that's four months long with a, with a public or private organization of their choice to apply what they have learned uh, into the real world. And this is a segue for them to then uh, complete their capstone project. So the capstone project is one of the required modules in this uh, Masters of uh, Biomedical Informatics. And this gives the students a, a graded assessment. And at the same time, it serves the purpose of uh, allowing the uh, potential few employers to know the intern better. And hopefully at the end of, that, um, of the degree, uh, when you graduate, uh, hopefully these uh, companies are going to be your employers. Now, indeed, uh, uh, earlier this morning, we, we just inducted the second uh, uh, cohort of Masters in Biomedical Informatics students. And I'm very proud to say that the last cohort, uh, quite a lot of our students have found jobs or placements, right? So they are, they, they are well along their way to becoming a specialist in this very exciting area of uh, biomedical informatics. And of course, um, the, we, we're not just teaching you the healthcare things, we're also teaching the computing-related things. So this is one of the very few um, interdisciplinary programs in the uh, National University of Singapore that incorporates four different schools, the School of Medicine, the School of Computing, the School of Public Health, as well as the Institute of System Science. So um, candidates are able to pick from a variety of uh, modules that, <clears throat> that might interest them. Um, within the, the whole entire cost structure. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so we also have um, data that's available that is desensitized or de-identified for the purposes of uh, students to uh, run their projects, uh, as well as the required uh, 
institutional setting for you to uh, contextualize the project. So many degrees just teach you, right? They don't give you the real world kind of applications. Here we are giving you real world problems, real world data, right? In order for, for the candidates to uh, undertake their projects. So an overview of the modules uh, is listed here. Um, th these are all available on our website as well, which you, you can uh, scan this QR code to uh, go to our website. You can see these uh, modular listings. So I just want to very quickly um, briefly mention about some of these uh, modules and how they relate uh, to uh, the application of BMI in, in healthcare. So of course, biomedical informatics is a core requirement. We will allow the uh, a particular can student to be able to understand and operate within that space of biomedical informatics. I teach this particular module, and I, I can share with you that um, we, we often have very exciting conversations with our students because this is their introductory module. Many of them come from a background of either being in IT or being in healthcare, but never both. Right, so this is, a good this is a good opportunity for the students to meet in the middle um, by attending these uh, modules. Um, we also are aware that uh, students have to do projects, so we teach them how to do projects. Indeed, in, in this module is from the Institute of System Science, this Advanced Agile Project Management. Um, so this, these are modern uh, agile methodologies that we want to teach our students to, so that they can manage their projects uh, going forwards. Medical data and data processing is a required uh, module precisely because we are going to be handling medical data and we want to teach students um, how, to, um, how to use the data well. And I teach part of this module as well um, to enable the students to, to learn the applications of uh, biomedical informatics in the healthcare data set. Uh, some coding is required, so we, we will teach software development fundamentals so that uh, uh, students are when they graduate, they have some ability to independently operate as uh, uh, biomedical informaticians or data scientists in their field. And I, as I mentioned earlier, we have the capstone project that is required uh, for our students to graduate. Under the elective uh, 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 degrees, uh, modules rather, um, there are electives that are more skewed towards analytics and electives that are more targeted towards hospital management. So you can see that some of these um, uh, modules are related to the things that I've mentioned. So artificial intelligence, digital uh, agility and change leadership, uh, health sciences for non-clinicians. So uh, a lot of our candidates ask us, well, I, I don't know anything about healthcare or biology, so will I be disadvantaged? So the answer is you, have, you can take this module for health sciences for non-clinicians where we have an expert clinician teaching our students how to what well, about some biological concepts and some terminologies that we use? So there are healthcare quantitative methods as well and statistical methods that uh, students can undertake. Some a sampling of the elective for hospital management. Uh, so you can see that these are value-based healthcare, clinical data systems, um, health economics financing, advanced stati statistical learning, and introduction to integrated care. So these are all modules that gear or empower a, a student to be able to function within the healthcare organization when they graduate, right? So whether it, it be a leadership or whether it be a process-related ability, these are covered under the elective for hospital management. So the core courses, uh, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, Advanced Biomedical Informatics really looks at how we use uh, the, uh, the day healthcare data from a day-to-day -day basis all the way from the raw data to its final form, whether it's analyzed data or using AI. So this is a little a screenshot of me pointing out some things. Uh, so these are, these are real-time data that's produced by the AI in predictions uh, in NUH, right? So this is built on a platform called Endeavor AI. This is something that we've built for now over three years when live. Um, so we, we definitely have the kind of use cases as well as the data for you to apply your knowledge in biomedical informatics. So project management, as I mentioned earlier, Agile is a, almost a standard way of developing software today. And we will teach these methods uh, to our students so that when they go into um, uh, a private or even a public sector uh, organization, uh, I think it's pretty default now. Most organizations use Agile methodologies to develop their software. And that's why we teach this module. 
Oops, excuse me. Just let me go back here. Okay, so um, the next um, course is the BMI 5207, which is medical data and data processing. Again, this is something that I teach. So we te teach about data standards, things like uh, SNOMAD, ICD-10, OMAR, uh, and uh, common data models. We learn healthcare, features of healthcare databases and processing of data that's aligned to international uh, medical standards. Uh, we teach also how you can transform data and use the data well and to, able, to enable national uh, and international collaborations using that data set. So this is a, one of the most popular courses offered by School of Computing. It's uh, IT5001. Um, this, this is really teaching about computing, right? This, uh, allow students to go deep into computing. So for the candidates who don't have any background in IT, this is a, this is a required course module, right? And stu many students, almost all our students take this module because they, they join BMI precisely because they want to be experts in this space. Uh, like I mentioned, the capstone project is a required module. So we, we also teach some structure in which we can uh, help um, students contextualize their, their project. So things like uh, Chris DM methodology for data analytics projects and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, this is the full uh, list of um, elective for analytics. I, I want to just point some other uh, modules that wasn't highlighted earlier. So molecular informatics is useful for um, candidates who want to operate in the precision med medicine field, meaning you want to do um, life science genomic data analysis. So molecular informatics is a great module to take. Uh, it is taught by Professor Fulifak. And you will really apply the real world applications of precision medicine in healthcare. Uh, in terms of um, one or two other interesting modules that I, I, thought, I think I bring up. So advanced human factors engineering is uh, taught by uh, Prof Nessa. So uh, this really teaches you how do you integrate um, uh, digital health technologies with human interfaces, right? How do you create and sustain those human interactions between technologies and, and humans? So uh, again, these are very uh, applied kind of uh, modules that, uh, are, that we use in day-to-day -day practice within healthcare itself. So a hospital uh, management elective, uh, again, I want to point out one or two interesting um, modules that wasn't brought up earlier. So the ethics of biotechnology and innovation is a, is a module that uh, I, I always felt that this is an essential core module, but I can't fit everything into all the core module. Because I think ethics is ever so important, especially in the age of uh, the use of AI. You know, how do we use AI well? Who should be um, deciding you know, what kind of outputs that the, the AI gives? And is the AI biased? So these are very important questions right, that will be addressed in the ethics of biotechnology and innovation module. Um, another in interesting one would be to look at uh, some of the uh, more management type modules, so st uh, strategic thinking and digital foresight. This allows the, the potential leaders or already the leaders in the field of healthcare or healthcare sectors to uh, be trained in using uh, in strategic thinking methodology and how you can address the needs of the organization relative to the real world uh, environment. Okay, so um, there's a whole list here. I, I can't go through all of them, but I think that uh, suffice to say that there's a lot of, there are many choices for uh, our students to choose from and to specialize in this area of hospital management. Okay, so uh, many students ask, okay, what can I do after I graduate, right? So simply put, um, you will be a data scientist in healthcare. That, that's what essentially you'll be trained to do, right? So, and that encompasses a whole range of capabilities, everything from um, data, data scientists in AI and machine learning to data analysts. So some students um, don't want to go so deep into AI, they can still undertake uh, data analytics type roles uh, within the uh, healthcare sector or in other sectors indeed. Uh, the data engineer is one of the most um, sought after positions in uh, any industry. Uh, except that no, nobody really teaches people how to be data engineers, right? You either become a DB admin or you're a data scientist. But I always felt that the data engineer is a very important uh, role within an organization. And of course, uh, in specific areas of uh, precision medicine, you can be a bioinformatics specialist. So people who work on genomic data, 
running research projects, uh, research uh, in, with using genomic data, they need people who know how to process this information. And this is a growing field, right? Because the, as more genomic data becomes available, there will be a greater demand for bioinformatics specialists. So in terms of hospital management track, uh, this is where people become uh, uh, C-suite uh, folks, right? So uh, CEOs, CTOs, CIOs, uh, CMIOs. So, so these C-suite folks, right? They need to have some idea of how their organization's digital um, structure functions. You, you can't just simply say that, okay, I went to business school and now I'm going to be a CEO of a digital health company. It, it doesn't quite work that way, right? You, you might know how to do the commercials, but then the, the actual nuts and bolts of healthcare, especially in the digital healthcare, relies on you knowing how the, fun how the entire system functions as well as how the data works. So, Many of the hospital specialization track folks will become chief executives, okay? And of course, I, I mentioned CTO, CIO. Um, the clinicians among us um, who take th this degree has a, have an opportunity to uh, do something really interesting, which is how can they turn their practice or digitize their practice or their processes using AI and machine learning? So this becomes, uh, they, they can become specialist medical practitioners in the space of AI and machine learning. Um, and many organizations are undergoing digital transformation. So uh, they have created roles like um, uh, Chief Transformation Officer, for example, or Transformation Office. So many of these include uh, items such as uh, digital transformation leads. So again, the, the modules that I mentioned earlier teach these kind of uh, methods to allow them to, to undertake these roles. Just to introduce uh, some of our faculty members, uh, these are our program committee members consisting of myself, Professor Jason Yap from the School of Public Health, uh, Dr. Adam Chi from the Institute of System Science, and Prof. Uh, uh, Seth Gilbert from the School of Computing. So each school is represented by one person, so it's very fair. Everyone gets an equal step at being uh, selected for the, module, for the degree. Um, just to show the rest of our faculty members, our faculty members are heavy on the practice side, and it's, it, it is a reflection of the ethos of the uh, degree, which is we want to be heavily focused on practice. We want uh, faculty to be your mentors, to be the supervisors for the projects. So the vast majority of our faculty members are practicing clinicians or practicing researchers uh, in their respective domains. So uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dermot uh, Murphy, he's a uh, assistant professor in orthopedics and senior consultant at NUH. He teaches and he, he is the chief value-driven outcomes officer or chief value officer at NUHS. So it goes without saying that he will be teaching on uh, value-driven outcomes modules, right? So these are modules that are already in practice and what they are going to be able to do is to teach you the concepts as well as the application cases for video outcomes. Uh, uh, Dr. Ian Matthews is a senior consultant and assistant professor at the uh, emergency department at NUH. And he's uh, also the deputy uh, group chief technology officer. So he teaches uh, the areas of how we can use informatics effectively in healthcare. And for the, for the uh, students who want to practice in hospitals going forwards, that module is essential for um, that practice. Dr. Terry Pan is our senior consultant uh, uh, anesthetist and he teaches the module that uh, uh, for healthcare concepts for non-clinicians. So students who come from a non-clinical background or non-biology -bi background, Dr. Terry will be teaching uh, students how to understand those very complicated long names, you know, in Greek and Latin. Okay, yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, Dr. Kenneth Bunn is our, uh, our chief, an uh, our anchor in uh, one of the core advanced biomedical informatics modules. Uh, Dr. Kenneth Bunn teaches many degrees, many courses, everything from undergraduate to postgraduate to executive education courses, right? And he's a, he's a, he's a super teacher because he's everywhere, right? And, and in terms of his modules. So um, uh, going forward, uh, you'll see a lot of uh, Dr. Kenneth Bunn. In fact, he, he, he's the one that most students will meet the very first time when they start their degrees. Uh, Dr. Lim Malun is a chief Group Chief Medical Informatics Officer at the National University Hospital uh, Health System, as well as Assistant Professor in Emergency Medicine Department. He, uh, he co-teaches the module that I, 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 I anchor with him, uh, which is the data uh, module. Dr. Amit Kansal uh, is a Assistant Professor in Department of Intensive Care Medicine at Ng Teng Fong Hospital. He teaches um, the, the module that 
uh, that looks at how you can use clinical decision support to uh, change the way we practice healthcare uh, in hospitals. Uh, Dr. Liu is a, a assistant professor from the Department of Pharmacy, and his area of specialization is in uh, genomic medis medicine. Uh, his area of research is in EQLTs, right? So those students who are taking bioinformatics modules um, can often end up doing uh, internships with him. In fact, he, he, he got the record number of interns the last time because uh, so many people were interested in uh, informatics. A um, few other uh, faculty members. Earlier, I mentioned uh, Dr. Nessa, who, um, who teaches the... Uh, uh, who teaches the module on human factors engineering. Uh, he is an assistant professor in the Department of Hematology and Oncology at NUHS. Uh, Dr. Ling is a uh, chief medical information officer at the regional health system uh, at NUHS and also the anchor for multiple courses and modules. So uh, just to emphasize again, right, many of our faculty members are practicing clinicians. They are doing two or sometimes three hats you know, on their day-to-day -day job. So I think they are overqualified to teach those modules uh, because they don't just teach the, 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 the background or the theory. They also can tell you about the practice. Dr. Folifak uh, uh, is a uh, assistant professor at the School of Medicine uh, as well as uh, part of the Center of Personalized and Precision Health. And no surprise, he teaches bioinformatics or molecular informatics is anchored by Dr. Folifak. And Dr. O is our uh, Deputy Chief Medical Officer at uh, Ng Teng Fong Hospital, and he teaches, co-teaches the module together with Dr. Ian Matthews. Um, Dr. Muhammad Shahir uh, is the, our lead uh, data scientist in the technology office at NUHS, and he is the main coordinator for all of our capstone as well as our internship projects. Uh, uh, Dr. Matthew Chua is an assistant professor at the uh, School of Medicine. Uh, he works uh, full-time for the Ministry of Defence and he teaches the modules uh, related to data and data analytics. Uh, Dr. Nicholas Sin is part of our School of Medicine and he teaches the um, evidence-based medicine module. Okay, so some uh, administrative things before we bring uh, this part of the talk to an end. So there are some very basic admission requirements. So you need to have a relevant degree. So we take degrees in, in medicine uh, or any bachelor honours degree in quantitative sciences, mathematics, applied mathematics, statistics, physics, uh, as well as any degree, uh, basic degree in engineering, computer science, business or health sciences related discipline. So the, the uh, relevant degree definition is quite broad. Right? So if you take any of these degrees, I think uh, you qualify. Uh, there are English requirements. You need to have an IELTS of a score of 6.0 and, 6 and above or a TOEFL score of 85 and above. And you need to submit a personal statement and CV okay, to elaborate on things like the motivation for joining the program, what are your career goals, um, how, why, why you are interested in the program, and relevant work uh, experience or internship. So um, I must emphasize that the personal statement and CV is quite important because we actually read it, okay? Uh, and that is the basis for many of the uh, offers that we give to our students. We really read these personal statements and their CVs. Okay, so this is a um, admission timeline for this uh, coming ac academic year. So the applications are uh, open from 1st of October this year through to 31st of January 2024. Submit the applications online uh, together with all the required documents as stated here. The application review goes through, through from November through to January where the admissions office will contact the uh, applicants via email if they require any supporting uh, documents. And the offer letters are given out at the end of April and offer acceptance by mid-May uh, 2024 with a $5,000 acceptance fee uh, in order to uh, uh, accept an offer and prepare for the enrollment. So orientation starts end of July, which is today. So today was my orientation for this academic year student, and the term starts in August. So um, with that, I thank you for your attention, and uh, we can open our questions and answer session now. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Professor, for sharing your time and expertise. Can we give a round of applause to Professor Nyam for his talk today? Okay, so as mentioned, there is the QR code. So if you are viewing it online, you, should be, you will be able to send in your questions on the chat box. Otherwise, you may want to scan the QR code or you may, can just approach the mic in the middle of the room and ask your question. 
Okay, so maybe I can just check in if there's any questions from the floor first before I move on to the online questions. Um, okay, so uh, thank you for your sharing. So I have two questions for you. So the first one is, um, what will be the standard process of deploying a AI technology uh, in large scale in, in healthcare? This is my first question. Uh, second question is, uh, what are some of the major concerns uh, that the down to the ground that they might have when applying an AI in healthcare, especially in uh, disease diagnosis? Okay. So, yeah, hope it's clear. Uh, thank you for that question. So, uh, if, if I take the first question uh, first, which is, uh, what are the steps to deploy AI in in hospital or clinical settings? Uh, that, that's a that, that's a subject of multiple modules okay, in our degree. So um, to, to kind of condense it a little bit, so first thing I think we have to start with is to identify the clinical problem we are trying to solve. Right? Um, again, we should never uh, find a, a problem for, with a piece of technology. I don't, I don't think that's the right approach. Uh, that's been done multiple times. We shouldn't be doing that. So we should start firstly uh, with the problem at hand. So what is the problem you're trying to solve? The second step is to decide whether you have the data to answer that question, right? So it doesn't mean that there's a problem, it can be answered. Uh, you need the data to be able to answer that question. And if you do have that data and you have sufficient amounts of data, then you can frame the question, or rather the, the, the hypothesis, uh, in which the so-called methods can be applied to, um, to, to have an outcome. So I'm just going to use an example. So this is not all um, theoretical, right? So we have multiple questions like this. So for example, we have a problem of trying to help the doctor make better diagnosis, right? That's a, often a common problem. Uh, doc most doctors are able to make a diagnosis very well, but if you can make it earlier and more precise, that would um, improve the care of the patient and reduce the amount of, say, investigations and delays that we have. So to do that, you really need a, a set of data that says, okay, this kind of text data is, has this kind of diagnosis, for example. So you need a large data set to be able to train the model. So now you want to train the model to say, okay, I want to say that you can identify whether a patient has this disease or not. So it's what I call a binary classifier, yes or no, right? And then you train the model using, say, NLP or structured data to say, okay, now the model is able to predict, given this text data, a particular output. But it doesn't end there, right? So uh, even if you can train a high-precision model in, in a lab setting, it doesn't mean that it will work the same way in the real world. So you need to set up experiments to be able to test the model in real-world setting. And herein comes the, the problem that most organizations face, which is they don't necessarily have the data available to them in real time. A lot of people have collections of data, multi-years of data that people have to take a long time data engineers that will take a long time to curate uh, or to clean up. And then when you apply into practice, you need live streaming data. You can't just have data that's one day delayed or three days delayed. It doesn't work, right? Because the doctors need to know the answer to the diagnosis immediately, right? Not, not when three days later when the patient is discharged. So this is an infrastructural question where you need to have real time data feeding into the AI tool to give you that output. And assuming that you get this far and you validated that, um, then this particular claim of saying making of being able to make a diagnosis is a medical claim. And that leads to your second question, right? Which is how do doctors accept the use of these AI technologies? So um, uh, it, by principle, it's no difference to any other um, medical device. In principle, there's no difference, right? So any medical device that either treat something or diagnose something needs to be subject to a regulatory approval process. So in this context, uh, we use something called the Software as a Medical Device Guidelines. Uh, this is published by the FDA way back in 2017. And in Singapore, we have our own set of guidelines uh, published uh, shortly after that, 2018 or 2019, where we also enumerate the, um, the Software as a Medical Device requirements if the AI tool has a medical claim. Uh, that's if it has a medical claim. If it, if it does not have a medical claim, then it does not fall within the remit of uh, a medical device. So that is the basis for which uh, clinicians or doctors can be convinced to use this tool. It's, it is based on evidence that the particular tool works well, uh, either in a 
test setting or in a real world setting, having done some kind of real world trial, whether it's randomized control trial or it's a cohort trial, uh, that is the basis of evidence in which you can convince clinicians to use this tool. One of the modules I mentioned earlier is human factors engineering, right? Just because you have an evidence-based tool that's validated, it doesn't mean that doctors will use it. You still have to go and ask the doctors, hey, you know, what's stopping you from using this tool, right? And sometimes it could be really simple, right? Something like, oh, I don't like the UI, or oh, it's too cumbersome, or it slows me down, you know? So these are human factors engineering that needs to be considered as part of change management. So again, everything that I'm talking about here they are somehow covered within one of the modules. Okay. Thank you, Professor Niam. So let's take on the, maybe we can go online. What should we take into consideration when choosing the specialization? Okay, that's a great question. So um, I think first thing uh, I would strongly suggest uh, students to do is uh, to have a sense of where, where, what you like better. I think that's the most important. Your passion or your interest is one of the key determinants of which specialization one want to take. So if you see yourself more in the, uh, you know, in the leadership kind of role, uh, rather than a person who is uh, coding or doing the actual data science, then hospital, uh, special, hospital management specialization is probably more appropriate. Uh, however, you know, a lot of our students choose the analytics side because they, they feel that that is a core technical skill that they have. And it's not just useful for um, healthcare setting. It's useful for any industry, right? You go to any industry today, right? Be it transport, be it uh, uh, education. If you have the ability to an collect uh, a clean and analyze data and use machine learning or AI methods, right? That's a valuable skill no matter where you go. So many students do choose the analytics specialization precisely because they want to acquire those skills. Okay, thank you, Professor. So is there any other questions from the floor? If not, then we'll just move on to the next one. So how is this course different from the Precision Health and Medicine program? Right, okay, thanks for that question. So um, as I shared earlier, this course has a, a very deep focus on um, machine learning and AI as the core capability. Of course, we have all the other capabilities built around it, right? Everything from leadership to um, uh, data analytics, data processing. Uh, where, and indeed, some of the precision health and medicine programs subscribe to some of our modules, uh, our BMI modules, as part of their modular offerings. Uh, but there's a distinction. Um, precision health and medicine programs dwell, dwell deeply more into the use of bioinformatics and how that applies in the healthcare arena. So the multi-omics kind of thing, so genomics, proteomics, uh, metabolomics. So um, precision health and medicine program focuses on those use cases, whereas we have a molecular informatics module that uh, touches on those areas, but we don't go into all the different kinds of omics. We don't go deep into bioinformatics, right? So there's a, there's a quite a different um, sort of um, uh, focus when it comes to looking at BMI masters and precision health and medicine program. Okay, so hope that has answered your question. Is there an opportunity to continue the master's into a PhD? Thank you. Um, okay, so this is an administrative question. Um, the short answer is that for coursework, uh, that is, it doesn't work that way. So you can't transfer credits from the coursework from master's to PhD. Um, but if you want to do a, indeed many of our students complete their master's and then they go on to do a PhD. Uh, even, even sort of uh, towards the end of their master's, they are already uh, arranging to do their PhD. So uh, the short answer is yes, but you, you can't really transfer credits uh, in, in the way that uh, I think this uh, uh, person is trying to ask. Yeah. Any questions from the floor? Hmm. Okay. Could you share some of the capstone projects that the students have taken in the past? Okay, uh -huh. so this is a deja vu for me. So this morning, I was just sharing exactly the whole list of uh, capstone projects. Uh, so we had over um, 50, I think, I think we had over 55 capstone projects in the last uh, cohort. Uh, the projects spread, uh, uh, there's an entire variety of different kinds of projects. Everything from very clinical type projects, uh, meaning uh, clinicians who have questions that they want uh, 
their students to, to explore, to work on under the supervision of the, the, a data scientist or the clinician. Uh, and things like, okay, how do you improve quality outcomes in a particular setting or how do you detect thrombosis in, in, in patients, right? So these are great clinical-based projects um, that are sized for a, a capstone. Uh, so a capstone is about four months long, right? And, but it's required module for you to pass the master's degree. So we always tell our students to please pick wisely, right? Mean, meaning you have to pick the correct topic you have to pick the correct size of a project and ideally the topic is something that they already have some capability to do. Right? You don't want to pick a topic that's completely off um, your ability, then you, you know, you'll be struggling. Uh, we do have very technical type projects. So for example, we had multiple projects that uh, are in the mixed reality space uh, using the HoloLens, for example. So that requires students to be quite technical uh, in able, being able to do some of their work already. And of course, uh, there are bioinformatics projects. Indeed, our bioinformatics uh, project list had, was oversubscribed this time round, the last time round. So uh, this time round, we will try to have more bioinformatics projects to uh, enable some variety you know, for, for our students to pick from. Yeah, so uh, to summarize, really, we have topics in almost every uh, uh, kind of uh, domain within healthcare. Uh, the question then is uh, whether the students have the right skill sets to, uh, to undertake them. Yeah. Can you share more about the Endeavor AI platform and the problems it addresses? Okay, thanks. So uh, very quickly, um, uh, earlier I mentioned Endeavor AI briefly, and uh, this, this is uh, something that is uh, relevant to an earlier question about how do we deploy AI in practice. So one of the problems we had in the past when we, we built a whole bunch of AI modules, and in fact, we validated a lot of these data models, but we weren't able to put them into practice effectively, precisely because we don't have the real-time data coming from the EMR system. So uh, since uh, 2019, we, we, we started a project called Endeavor AI to integrate, to take data out of the EMR system in real time and feed it into the AI tools that will then signal back to the clinicians in real time. So these, uh, this platform is called Endeavor AI and it's been operational now for a good part of two years. Uh, we've built a large number of different uh, AI tools on board. Uh, what we didn't build, we, we built it, and then we put these uh, models into practice on Endeavor AI. So today, we have a system that the doctors can get AI outputs in real time without them needing to, without them needing to go and click on something or to do some, some action, right? Because um, this is realizing the, the, the real potential of AI, which is to have AI signal in real time to our clinicians and support their practice in healthcare. Okay, thank you. Could you share some real life applications and limitations of LLMs in healthcare? Okay, so just to define what LLM is, LLM is a large language model, right? So, so the most um, popular large language model, as, as you might know, is ChatGPT that has been around uh, since last year, late last year. So that, that is uh, a a language model that is, uh, that is produced and trained by uh, OpenAI, as you know, um, part of a Microsoft company. Um, many people use it. It's very, very powerful. It's very effective. Uh, today, it has, it's, it's at the 4.0 version. Uh, it can do a great number of tasks, everything from conversational tasks to um, summarization tasks and to data retrieval. In, in, indeed, there's a whole new um, area of study that is emerging because of LLMs. But something happened earlier this year that changed the field even more dramatically, which is the release of open source LLMs. So um, up to that point, uh, in about March, uh, there, were only, there was only ChatGPT as the publicly available LLM that's not available to most people. But since March, uh, a number of companies and, and institutions have released uh, open source LLMs. And these open source LLMs allow anybody to use those uh, and do run experiments on LLMs so that they can adapt or to fine tune the models to their use cases. We have been working on LLMs since many years ago and especially in the last six months, uh, it, it is frenzy, feeding frenzy time for LLMs because it's such an exciting new area. And because of that, um, I have uh, instructed all our faculty members to incorporate LLMs into their modules uh, in, in every way possible, whether it be theoretical or it be application 
or how it can be effectively deployed into their practice. So um, in terms of real-life applications, broadly you can break it down into three, right? So the base applications will be all the English language related applications, things like summarization, writing referral letters, writing memos. Uh, some of you might write, use it to write emails, right? So um, some of our students, of course, use it to write their, 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 ref, uh, their statement, uh, personal statements as well. So there are many English language capabilities that are that is precisely why LLMs are designed for. And then there's a specific language capability that is conversational in nature, so it allows you to have a chatbot kind of experience, uh, Q&A. The second layer would be more in the research space, how can we use LLMs to solve, solve for specific problems? So you can task the LLM to um, solve for a specific prediction task, uh, like I mentioned earlier, uh, diagnosis task. Now it becomes trivial for the LLM to solve that problem because it already built in the right context. Uh, and to quickly just mention the third use cases, we can use uh, LLMs in a more advanced way even. So we can use them as agents. Uh, so you can have multiple LLMs that are working in, uh, as agents in connection to one another to uh, undertake more complex uh, reasoning tasks. So these are all under exploration at this point. Uh, I'm very excited that uh, we shall be able to share some of these uh, capabilities with our students. Okay, thank you. So, any questions from the floor? Uh, I have a question. Sure. Uh, hi, uh, Dr. Niam. Uh, yeah. So, um, if I'm not mistaken, recently ChatGPT released um, plugin capabilities that are able to do data anal analysis on its own. Yeah. So, how do you think this would affect the um, industry, or how would this affect work for data analysts in the future, given okay. that ChatGPT is capable of doing such things? Okay, so um, there, there are many uh, such people who look at the crystal ball and say, okay, there, there's no more data analyst job in, in a few years. I, I think that's only partially true, right? Um, I, yes, no doubt the, the capabilities now and upcoming capabilities are very impressive. You can literally put a data set and ask it to run ask it for a result and you'll run a large number of uh, uh, tools or statistical tools to get you the right result. So no doubt you can do that. But I, I think at this point, um, nobody is 100% sure that it gets it right all the time. So for data analysts, um, there's still, there is still a requirement for data analysts to be able to check and interpret the results uh, given by a language model like ChatGPT. So uh, the same is true for many other um, many other kinds of uh, job descriptions. So some people have predicted that pro you do not need software engineers anymore going, in, going forwards because ChatGPT can code, right? So the codex that's within ChatGPT is able to code very, very professionally, even if you haven't had a single day of learning how to code in any uh, programming language. But that's it, the, the same thing applies, right? Just because you, the, you can generate a code doesn't mean that it is 100% right or it's without bugs. Uh, no doubt you can fix some of these bugs. Uh, to build an entire program, I still think you, you, you need software engineers and humans to be able to do that. So um, I suppose the takeaway message here is um, if, you don't, if you can't beat them, you join them. That's the best way to do it. You can't, if you think that ChatGPT is going to take over many of the jobs that are coming up, then why don't you just learn how to use ChatGPT well, right? which is what we are going to be teaching in our modules. All right. Thank you for that, Rob. Yeah. I think we have time for one or two more questions. So maybe I'll just invite somebody from the floor to ask a question. Otherwise, we'll go to the one on screen. OK, let's go to the one on screen. I'm in my final year of undergraduate studies in biomedical science. Could the professor please share some advice on how I can better prepare for this program? Yeah, so uh, the best way you can prepare is to apply. <laughs> Graduate and apply, yeah? That I can't tell you more. You graduate and you apply, and uh, we will review your application. Um, if, if you want to learn something, uh, okay, we have a great number of biomedical science um, graduates, uh, under, uh, undergrads who are gra graduating and want to go into this space. So um, I think it will be useful if you don't have some form of coding background to pick up some basic coding skills. Because it, it, you know, a lot of the modules that we have um, require some basic understanding of coding, right, to be able to um, 
you know, operationalize or effectively use the information that is being taught by those modules. So if, if there's one thing you, you can do in your own time, there are many online courses, uh, that would be something that I would advise students to do. Yeah. Okay. So maybe we have a last question. Anybody on the floor? Okay. So this person wants to know, what is the percentage of clinicians versus non-clinicians in this program? Is there any quota for that? Okay, uh, that, thanks for the question. Uh, short answer is there's no quota uh, for clinicians versus non-clinicians. Um, we, we, in the past cohort and in this current cohort, um, I think the, the clinicians are in the minority. Uh, we are talking about less than 10% are clinicians in every uh, sense of the word because um, there are some, uh, as a clinician, I can understand the, the challenges. The challenge is usually because you are having a full-time job as a clinician, uh, it's very hard to commit time to do it, to do a master's degree. Um, but I put it to um, many clinicians as well, who are my colleagues, right, and said, well, if you don't make time to learn this, you'll never learn this. So it's, it's, it's just a matter of saying that this is an emerging field. This is a field that is going to make your life better. right? Uh, why don't you spend some time and, and commit some resources to learn this so that you, you are going to be leading that field rather than learning, lagging in that field, right? So, uh, yeah, we, we look forward to more clinicians joining uh, this uh, uh, master's degree. And I, I can share one last point, which is um, the, the moment they graduate, right, everything that they have learned will be ap applicable 100% to their day-to-day -day job, right? Because every clinician has to see patients, have to deal with patient data. There's just no other way about it. And healthcare is about using the information well. So um, yeah, we, we, we're really looking forward to more clinicians joining us. Okay. Thank you, Professor Niam. So that concludes our session. And can everybody give Professor Niam a round of applause for the wonderful talk that he just gave? So that concludes it. And we would like to invite everybody here to share your views on our event as well as the presentation that you just saw.